So, in the third lecture, we are going to combine electromagnetic and weak interaction and going to look into some closer points here. Uh, please uh, remember this if I am going for the mathematical deduction of electro weak interaction is going to take a very long time and uh, that is why I am just sticking to the uh, qualitative uh, idea and not the quantitative definitions. We are not going to look into any kind of equation. So, this particular lecture is going to be uh, again very much theoretical and we are going to have a read through. So, that uh, as time goes on we are just going to uh, understand this uh, better. Okay. So, uh, so, if you go into the unification uh, theory, uh, we have a number of unification and the first of it was actually nothing but the electro weak interaction, which was initially thought to be easier to combine and we had a proof of uh, the exchange particles that we had in the electro weak interaction, uh, because of which it became further easy. But there were some fundamental aspects which we need to understand. The theory describes both uh, the electromagnetic force and the weak force and uh, superficially this force appears quite different. Uh, one of the major reason is when we consider the bosons in weak force the W Z bosons, they are massive, but on, on the other hand if you consider something as photon they are very light particles. Now, the interaction or the range of uh, photon is again infinite, but when we consider boson it is in the range of 10 to the power minus 15 minus 16, so it is very very short range. So, how exactly do we combine them, what we exactly we can do or under what condition they can be combined. So, this is what was the mathematical framework was all about. So, uh, the weak force only acts across distance smaller than the atomic nuclei while the electromagnetic force can extend for greater distances. Okay. So, when we consider the light of stars reaching across the entire galaxies okay, more or less electromagnetic in nature these are basically nothing but uh, a higher uh, range uh, energy. Okay and these weakens as only with the square of the distance. Now, the comparison of these two fundamental uh, interaction that is the weak and the electromagnetic force between protons for instance reveals that weak forces is 10 million times weaker than the electromagnetic force very short range 10 million times weaker still we can combine. Okay. But then in spite of these uh, 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 is confusions or these doubts. Okay, the major discovery of the 20th century has been the two forces of different facets of a single more fundamental electro weak force. So, it is one of the biggest achievements of the 20th century in the 1980s, 1970s. Okay. Uh, these works have been done and then we had the combination of the electromagnetic and the weak force. So, the electro weak force uh, principally uh, arose uh, out of the attempts to produce a self consistent gauge theory for the weak force. So, gauge theory has its origin in uh, 19 uh, uh, in 1800 in fact, when we actually talked about uh, in the late 1800s uh, when we talked about uh, Maxwell's equation uh, uh, the gauge theory was implemented there. So, gauge theory is not something which is only used in particle physics and all it is also implemented in electromagnetism and so on. Okay. So, so this was the same theory which was applied even for the weak force. And when it was applied for the weak force, it was assumed, uh, it was seen that uh, uh, even if the electro weak uh, theory is combined, uh, this uh, theory actually stood valid. What is Gauss theory exactly or what is the basic idea of Gauss theory, I am going to tell you in the next slide. So, the successful modern theory of electromagnetic force developed in the 1940s. Okay. So, that was the modern theory. Now, there are two basic requirements of the Gauss theory of weak force. By Gauss theory of weak force, we mean the electro weak theory okay, to remember this. So, exhibits an underlying mathematical symmetry. So, basically Gauss theory gives you a mathematical symmetry that means under certain operations certain component remains invariant. So, that is called gauge invariance. So, you do some kind of operation, okay, but the system as a whole the output does not change such that the effect of the force are the same at different points in space and time. So, just read this line again and again and I think it should be very clear to you. And then again the theory should be renormalizable. That means, it should not contain non-physical infinite quantities. So, it should not have any uh, quantity which is let us say imaginary okay? and, and the quantity that we consider in this kind of theory it should not be infinite in nature, it should have some finite value. So, if you look into the Gauss theory uh, in the 1960s uh, Sheldon Lee Glasgow, Abdul Salam and Steven uh, Weinberg 
Abdul Salam is uh, one of the great uh, theoretical physicists. Uh, he belongs to Pakistan. He also received his uh, Nobel Prize. Okay, and he has done some path-breaking work in the in this field. Okay, in combination of uh, different forces, and uh, these three independently actually discovered that they basically can uh, construct a gauge invariant theory even for the weak force. So as I said, gauge theory was uh, prevalent uh, long before uh, people talked about weak force. Electroweak force or uh, the high energy physics, but then they saw that this Gauss theory is applicable even for the weak forces. Uh, but then, if we want to apply it for the weak force, we have to include the electromagnetic force. As a result, that means the combination is actually possible as per the theory. So this theory actually was formed on the base of four massless messenger or carrier particles, out of which two are electrically charged and two are neutral. To meditate. The unified electroweak interaction. So, if you consider something like photon, okay, or the bosons, W bosons and the Z bosons, okay, and we have got the W plus W minus bosons and so on. Uh, so, so these are the charged particles and the neutral particles which are there, uh, which actually meditates uh, the uh, uni electroweak interaction. The short range of the weak force indicates that it is carried by massive particles. So, weak force are short in nature. Uh, so, it is uh, the exchange particle is very much massive. So, if you in general basically consider something like uh, uh, a normal uh, ball okay, or normal cricket ball, uh, you can actually throw it at a larger distance. But if you consider something like as a pin ball, okay, it is a very heavy ball, uh, you can basically not throw it at a larger distance because this is very heavy. So, that means uh, the interaction if you are standing on this end and the one person is standing on this end and if you are throwing a heavy ball you should be closer to each other but if you are throwing a lighter ball even if you are at further distance you can still throw it okay so that is the basic analogy okay uh, so it's massive particle is basically short range in nature what does this imply this implies that the underlying symmetry of the theory is hidden or broken now electro weak uh, electromagnetic and the weak theory they are having a weak interaction they have got a lot of different aspects uh, which superficially looks uh, difficult uh, to combine together but uh, Gauss theory says that they can be combined. So, that means there should be some kind of theory okay, or some kind of mechanism that actually is allows them to be combined. So, or broken by the same mechanism that gives mass to the particle exchange in weak interaction, but not to photons exchanged in electromagnetic interaction. So, this theory says that they can be combined. Okay. So, the assumed mechanism involves an additional interaction with an otherwise unseen field called the Higgs field that pervades all space and as you will know 2012 Higgs boson was discovered. So, that means this Higgs field is also very much in the picture today, but it was also assumed long back that there should be an unseen field which is called the Higgs field which also helps in combination of the electromagnetic and the weak interaction. So, what happened in 1970s uh, uh, Gerardus Hooft and Martinus Weltman provided the mathematical foundation. Okay. So, then obviously, we need to have a mathematical background for this and they did it to renormalize the unified electroweak theory proposed earlier by Glasgow, Salam and Winberg. Now, why, why it was needed to renormalize? Again, please mark this as an objective question maybe. Why it is important to renormalize? Basically, there are some physical inherent uh, inconsistencies in earlier calculation of the properties of the carrier particle. So, if we studied into the properties of the carrier particle uh, as per some earlier theory, there has been some inconsistency. Now, in order to remove this inconsistency, uh, we, we had uh, this uh, renormalization factor. Permitted uh, precise uh, calculation of the masses. So, the masses of these particles which were not yet calculated, in fact, at that time it was not even discovered whether you consider the uh, bosons okay, or even the Higgs boson okay, or even the W and the Z bosons. Okay. These were not yet discovered at that time, but the precise calculation of their masses could be achieved by renormalizing it. And then uh, once these problems were tackled, uh, this actually led to a more general acceptance of the electroweak theory. And then uh, the existence of the force carrier. So, we had the neutral Z particles okay, and the charged uh, W particles. So, as we said two neutral particles, so that means Z particles and the photon and the charged particle that means we had the charged W particles was experimentally uh, verified in 1983 in CERN. 
they basically conducted a proton anti proton collision we have talked about it in the first unit okay and then it was experimentally verified in the year 1983 now the masses of these particles were very much consistent with the prediction that was done in the mathematical formulation in the 1970s so that means this theory was more or less globally acceptable so a gauge theory is uh, basically a quantum field theory basically has got a lot of maths and it's a mathematical theory which involves both uh, quantum mechanics and einstein's special theory of relativity so if you go through uh, quantum mechanics obviously all of you have done your quantum mechanics 1 and 2 uh, and also you have studied about einstein's special theory of relativity be it in classical mechanics or separately but uh, if you combine these two you basically get a quantum field theory which is called the gauss theory which is also a different and higher order Uh, physics that we are studying so high energy physics uh, is 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 actually a part of quantum field theory and this is used is usually used to describe subatomic particle and and their associated wave fields gauge invariance on the other hand if we say is basically an invariance so basically if you do some kind of operation on a system the output doesn't change so that is basically gauge invariance so if you do a group of transformation of the field variables gauge transformation we say that leaves the basic physics of the quantum field unchanged so output doesn't change it gives the theory a certain symmetry which governs its equation so it gives a kind of symmetry that is present in the system so that symmetry is very important and that is what forms the basis of gauss theory so classical theory of electromagnetic field was given long back in the year 1864 by uh, maxwell and he has given four uh, equations okay if you all remember and then uh, these uh, are actually nothing but the prototype of gauss theory so initially gauss theory which was applied to the electromagnetic field actually begin here and what happened in uh, maxwell's uh, theory the basic field uh, variables are the strength of the electric and the magnetic field so there needs to be some kind of variable and if we can vary the electric and the magnetic field which is represented by e and uh, b if you remember the magnetic field also represented with h not with the magnetic field okay Uh, they can be actually described in terms of some auxiliary variables so how do you represent this magnetic field you can actually represent it in auxiliary variable the scalar and the vector potentials okay so there are some scalar and the vector potential and if you remember we use the delta function and so on okay so what happens is the gauss transformation which is applied in this theory consists of certain alteration in the values of those potential so this scalar potential and the vector potential if we change it they basically don't change the result of the electric and the magnetic field and that is what that is the theoretical understanding of the gauge invariance so uh, uh, in here i'd like to tell you some some of the work that has been done using the gauss theory so a gauss theory is also applied to strong interaction and we have the group of gauss transformation in this theory which deals with the isospin of strongly interacting particles so isospin is the quantum number which is used in strong interaction and uh, this isospin is actually involved in the gauss theory that is being used for strong st interaction studies in the late 1960s a gauss theory was uh, applied that basically treats the electric electromagnetic and weak interaction in a unified manner so that is what we are actually looked into in this particular lecture in the during mid uh, 1970s uh, what was done was even gauss theory was used to help improve uh, or better understanding towards the quantum chromodynamics yeah we're talking about the flavors and uh, this actually talked about the gauge theory interaction between the quarks so this concept of gauge invariance basically seems very much fundamental it started from electromagnetic theory and we are still using it and we are seeing that many mathematical formulations can be formed uh, without violating the laws of physics okay and uh, hence it is believed that uh, the unification of all the four fundamental interaction can actually be achieved finally by using gauss theory so we need to understand gauss theory we need to understand uh, quantum mechanics and we need to understand the special theory of relativity so that we can actually unify all these four forces uh, which is still a bit far from us right now okay so that's all for today